An unusual video today. This is not a wheel review. This is a review of a wheel reviewer. Very rare that you'd see that. I think what's happening in, at the moment is really, really interesting. You see, there is an absolute flood of wheels and the Chinese brands are being amazing at sending various YouTubers all sorts of weird and wonderful wheels right now. And at the same time, we have a big movement in what's going on with carbon spoke technology and all sorts. So it's a very confusing landscape at the moment. So what Hambini is doing right now, I really want to applaud. And that is that he is now releasing some really detailed wheel review specification sheets. And I thought this video would be quite interesting because what he hasn't done so far is explain to us one, his methodology of testing, but also what is the important data and what it actually means in reality. So I'm gonna try and shed some light on that and also give my review on what I think of these. There's some data on here that is missing, I really think should be included. And again, we're gonna open up the comment section to you to have the opportunity to give your feedback and hopefully push this whole project forward because I think what he's doing is actually really important. What I have done out of respect for Hambini's work is I've redacted all the bits and pieces so you've got no idea what wheel this relates to because this is going to be behind a paywall on his Patreon. So I'm going to show you the, the stats but not necessarily link it to a certain type of wheel. This is all about what you're actually looking at and how to, you can translate it and make use of it. So the very first thing, he obviously lists down all of the wheel, the thing that you're actually looking at, and then he has some general notes. Sadly on this one, he has made a mistake where he's made the notes radial lacing on left and right side of front and rear wheels. Sadly, the wheel that he actually tested was um, a straight pull hub and it was actually a two cross front and rear on the left and the right. And that means that as the spoke leaves here, this is a, a similar example. This is actually a three cross. You've got one cross here, two cross here, and three cross. Whereas on the other side, you'll be able to see you've got um, a single cross, just a one cross design. So I would describe this as three cross on the drive side and one cross on the non-drive side. Radial is when there's no crosses at all. So you need to look out for that because there are still some errors in here. The next thing he does is he lists all of the scientific testing equipment that he uses, uh, the brand names of them, and gives some sort of methodology as to how he went through testing from datum points. And some interesting stuff on here because there are definitely some tools that we would not use in bike shops at all. So there's a balancing machine from a German company called Schneck and this would be used to check the overall balance uh, of the wheel. Very rare that you would see that in anything outside of an engineering supply. So I guess that's something he's got access to through his work. The rest of it is all relatively generic stuff. So measuring gauges for dial test indicators which are this sort of thing but just made by a very renowned brand. There's also some humidity sensors, a set of scales uh, from Buer, again, a very respected brand of, of measuring scales. And interestingly, there is a Trummy from FAG, which is obviously a bearing manufacturer, which we'll get onto in a second, because that's an interesting way of testing spoke tension that's definitely unusual in the bike industry. So that's the front page, um, just gives you the information about the wheels. So then he goes into uh, front and rear wheels of giving you an overview of what it is that we're testing. Up here in the top left hand corner gives us all the dimensions. And this looks like it's come from the, the manufacturer's website rather than an accurate measurement because we've got in here 21 millimeters internal. It's very, very rare that an internal measurement is exactly 21 millimeters. There's nearly always some deviation there. And it's a very difficult measurement to get because you've got to try and get underneath the lip there. So be interested to know whether that was actually measured and whether that was measured consistently around the whole wheel. So if there were any inconsistencies, it'd be interesting to know if that showed up because that would have an impact on how your tire performs. The external width also at 28.8, I'd be keen to know whether that was actually measured or taken from the website. And then the depth of the wheel here listed at 58 millimeters. The weight at 732 grams. Now, what he hasn't done here is done a comparison between what he actually measured and what the manufacturer said it was, because I think that would be a really interesting metric for us all to see as to how it actually compared to what was quoted uh, on the website. So I'd love to see that included in the future. And then an idea whether it was tubeless uh, yes or no. It'd be nice if we started to, to use the proper terminology from that, so TSS for tubeless straight side or TC for tubeless crotchet. 
um, rather than just a tubeless yes or no. And the bead type is hook to hook look. So it's, it's kind of the same thing, but it'd be just nice if we were using the proper terminology. What isn't mentioned here is any sort of details about the drop channel. Now, I think that is actually a pretty important metric because the drop channel gives you an idea as to how hard or easy it's gonna to be to mount a tire. So if you have the drop channel, when you're mounting the tire, the drop channel allows the bead of the tire to drop into that and therefore reduce the diameter of the wheel and make it easier for you to get a tire on and off. Now, if you have a very deep drop channel, that impacts the strength of the wheel because you now have a, lot, a deeper uh, chamber in there but it also adds some weight as well. So there's always a compromise between making the drop channel deep enough to mount tires, adding extra material to make it happen and reducing some strength in there as well. So it'd be interesting to see if that was included, but also give us some idea as to the actual tolerances, especially when it comes to tubeless straight side. Remember, they have to be made to a very fine tolerance, six millimeters, and that six millimeters need to be consistent the whole way around the wheel. And if it isn't, the manufacturer normally gives you instructions to make up the difference uh, with wraps of rim tape. I think that'd be a really important thing to include on this test document as to how many wraps of rim tape you might need to make up that six millimetre depth. Um, so there we go. Tell me what you think down in the comments. The next part of the stats here is about spokes. And on here, we don't have the brand listed. All we have is whether it's bladed or not, the cord, which is the width essentially, the thickness, um, and then the nipple exposure. On this one, he hasn't actually listed any nipple exposure at all. So I'd assume that that is an internal nipple. It'd be nice if that was actually listed. The nipple exposure is fairly important because you want to know how much of a nipple you've got to get a tool on. If it's too shallow, then it can be difficult to get a tool on. Most of the time they are longer, so you might have a 12, 14 or 16 millimeter to help you with that, depending on the thickness of the rim at that point. Um, again, more detail here, especially relating to the manufacturer of the spoke so that you had some idea of who made it. This particular wheel is actually a carbon spoke and the brands behind carbon spokes is quite tricky because there isn't really a big brand like DT Swiss or Sapin making carbon spokes. There's an awful lot of Chinese factories. There's not really a website you can go to and say, I wanna buy a carbon spoke. There's a few very niche uh, brands out there, which I'll show you in a second, because it leads on to my next point is at some point we need to know what the manufacturer's recommendation is for the tension because when we are judging the tension, we need to know how it relates to what the manufacturer's specifications are. So the next column down, we talk about the spoke tension. So this particular wheel has 10 spokes on the left-hand side, 10 spokes on the right-hand side, and then we can see a value down here and then the delta on the average. Now, what's missing from this is knowing exactly what the metric is. So I presume it is kilograms of force, but that's not written down. If it is kilograms of force, then these numbers here are very high. Normally, uh, a spoke would be in the range of 110 to 130 as a maximum. Um, even with carbon spokes, you'd go up to 130, possibly even 120 maximum. So if these measurements are right, I'll be very concerned that they've exceeded the manufacturer's maximum. But unfortunately, that's missing from this table here. I'd love to see that included as to what's the manufacturer's recommendation for minimums and maximums, and then how do the measured tensions relate to that information? I think that's a really critical piece of data that's missing from this. The actual averages, we're looking for a balancing of the spoke tension. So what we have here is the average spoke tension and then how much it deviates from each other. Now, a good wheel builder would be easily be able to get that down to less than 5% and on this wheel, it says 2% or 2.11. So we are, we're looking pretty good. I wouldn't say it's excellent, but it's, it, it's pretty good. What we don't know is exactly how this is measured. So we would normally use a deflection gauge like this. This is a very, very basic one that you'll find in nearly every single bike shop. You can calibrate these, but most of the time we just throw them away and, and, and move them on because it's almost cheaper to do that rather than worry about calibrating them. But what this essentially measures is we're gonna bend the spoke. So this does not measure kilograms of force. This measures a generic number, so in this case 16, that we would again go to a lookup chart and then for a spoke of this thickness and this width, we expect it to deflect this much and therefore that represents a kilograms of force value. That's why the calibration is so important because it doesn't actually measure the actual tension. A trummy is a laser 
uh, device that's more common in finding the tension in belt drives uh, on a car or engineering supplies and you would set up the trummy and you would put in certain parameters about how heavy and how thick or what the manufacturer was and then you would vibrate the belt and the laser would give you an idea of the tension of that belt. I don't know of any trummies that have the characteristics of a carbon spoke built into them. So I would really, really love if Hambini sort of published his methodology as to how he got to these numbers. Quick sidebar on this, I've just reached out to Hambini as a matter of courtesy before releasing this video and I asked him about how he was measuring tension with a laser trummy and he gave a little bit more context to that. Essentially he's just using a fairly familiar equation called Mersenne's law rearranged to give us tension. So that gives us the equation that tension equals four times mass times length times frequency squared. So for that we need to work out a few things. One, we need to know the mass of the spoke and in the point from where we are measuring the vibrating length. And that actually raises some questions because the vibrating length would probably be between where the intersection is rather than the mass of the whole spoke. So that would require the whole spoke being removed unless you're doing a percentage of what the manufacturer recommends. So interesting, I'd love to see how he's getting to that. Um, also, you have that problem of a mix of materials because these carbon spokes are made with bonded in aluminium ends and that would affect things as well. It's gonna be dead interesting to see how that all pans out. Now, with a deflection reading, you don't have that problem of where to measure because as you put the deflection reading on, it bends it away from the spoke that it's interlaced with. So you can take the deflection on the whole length of the spoke. The thing is, when you look down at the numbers, this is where I get my cause for concern because um, they don't quite add up. So either there is a super strong rim and a super strong spoke that I'm unaware of because building up to 140 kilograms of force is you know, really, really high tension. So that is a possibility that they are super, super strong. I'd love to know that. Um, or the wheel maker has over tensioned those spokes to the point where they're potentially quite dangerous. I'd love to know that information. And the third one is that the measurement is wrong. So I think a little bit more context on that would be super cool. Right, back to the video. So we have here, we have the little diagram of where the wheel balancing is, and then we have the left and the right. Visualize, because now you can see where the differences in spoke tension are. So on this one, you can just about see that we are quite tight to the averages here, and here there's a bit of a gap to where the averages are. So ideally, we're trying to find the spoke tension that's balanced around the whole wheel, but if there are big area of inconsistencies that should show up visually um, on that graph. The other graph here is a representation of the actual run out. So this is a sensor placed either here um, just to look at how that run out is going. So that's similar to what we would do in a bike shop. We would use measuring devices like this and we'll be looking for less than 0.1 of a millimeter. So this gauge or centered on the zero we would be looking for this needle moving no further than the 0 0.9 and the 0 0.1, which would represent 0.2 of a millimeter tolerance. So that's general rim condition spoke and how true things are. A great start, but definitely a few bits and pieces missing. The subject of hubs uh, is covered fairly in depth, actually. And there's a few things that he does here. One, he definitely lists um, the, the hub manufacturer. Things that are missing from this are things like the points of engagement, whether it is a pool type system or whether it's a, a ratchet type system. And if it is, how many teeth are engaged in each one of those. So it'd be good to see if it's a ratchet system, how many teeth, how many points of engagement are. If it's a pool system, whether those pools how numerous they are and whether those pools are also notched as well, similar to what the uh, Hope are doing. I think that information would be really critical to have on here. The other thing that he's measured is the run out and he's measured the run out in two areas. One in the where the axle would interface and two where the disc would interface. These are the two that would probably affect you the most. It's a good place to measure. I'm not convinced this is going to be majorly important because these are all made on a lathe pretty accurately anyway. So it would take some real engineering <laughs> quittery to uh, get this wrong. Essentially what he's done is place a gauge and my pencil is here and spun this and we're looking for any deviation at these points. I wouldn't expect there to be any unless something had gone seriously wrong in manufacturing. In fact, you can see here that the run out on this is virtually zero. The other thing that's listed here is all of the bearing stats as well. So this is gonna be quite challenging to do. And in fact, you can see on here, it's just listed OEM when you're not able to identify who makes the bearing because quite often they're unbranded. We just have it as OEM. It is pretty useful to be able to see the bearings, which means that you can go online, order the bearings, and be confident that you've ordered the right ones before taking your wheel apart and having to do with that your bike while you're waiting for things to arrive in the post. There's a few on this one which are 
normal ISO bearings and there's a few in here which are just millimeter spec so 15267 for instance and he's listed all those down so you know the OD ID and the width etc of all of those he has included what the clearance is so clearance I'm listed as CN or C3 quite commonly in the bicycle industry and again if it's an OEM bearing I'd be interested to know how we obtained that information hopefully that'll come out in a methodology video that Hanbini does in the future and then lastly uh, <laughs> aerodynamics now this is going to be a, a very contentious issue we don't really have any details of how he was testing but we do see that we are testing with a Grand Prix 5000 uh, in a measured width of 28 so I'm presuming that he's testing it with a 28 millimeter tire also list that we are fitting it with a Shimano Ice Tech rotor. I presume that is a Dura Ace one, but it doesn't say 160 millimeters on the front, 140. It doesn't say whether we are fitting it with a cassette on the rear, but I think you can see uh, on the charts here how that relates because on the left and the right, you can see where a disc rotor or a cassette are influencing the aerodynamic results. The problem with this is that we need context. It's hard to know whether this is good or not because we need several wheels to be tested with exactly the same methodology against each other to have any idea of whether this is good. And as we know from that cycling news um, wheel test, it's very hard to compare oranges with oranges because this is a 58 millimeter wheel. So you have to test it against another 58 millimeter wheel. You can't test it against another 55 millimeter wheel because then you're not testing the same thing and there'll always be a difference. So this is uh, for me <laughs> gonna be one of the most uh, contentious things that's gonna come out of this. But to sum up, I think what's really missing from this and I really hope that as this develops, it gets on top of is how everything compares to what the manufacturer is actually claiming but also how does it compare to the ISO standards or the manufacturer's guidance? So in terms of whether it's a tubeless straight side, how does it actually compare to what's required in terms of its true and tolerances? How does it compare to what you know, ISO standards, BSA standards, et cetera, say it should be? And also the safe operating limits of the spokes and the hubs how does that measure up would be really, really useful, I think, for us all to know. I'd also like to see a rundown of the materials used. For instance, when we were just talking about carbon spokes, are they with aluminium nipples or with, are they with titanium threads? I think that would be important to note. Um, and if we're using brass or aluminium, I think would be really, really important to see on this, this document as well. And then, yeah, the, the aero comparison, uh, that's gonna take a, a lot, a lot of work to start building that database out. But hopefully we'll get there where we have something similar to the rolling resistance website where we can actually go on and see some actual independent testing um, on a published methodology that we can all get behind. So in general, I really, really applaud what Hanbini is doing here. I hope you found this video useful as a way that if you're gonna interact with this document as to how to read it, understand it, translate it, look for the gaps and question it if you need to as well. And um, yeah, please put down in the comments um, what you would like to see from a wheel test reviewer, what information would be really, really important for you to do. Okay, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please think about subscribing. I'll see you dead soon on the next one. Cheers.